views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Welcome to a paranormal show unlike any other. The Ghost Helper Show with your guides, Tina Irwin and Laura Van Tyne. Where the paranormal is more normal than you think. We are seasoned psychics who once led normal, everyday lives just like you. Until the paranormal world refused to be ignored any longer. We have listened to countless dead tell their stories, and we are sharing that knowledge with you. Join us each week as we take a piece of the paranormal and explain how it works using true ghost stories, the tales that the dead have told us. Our intention is to offer new insights and understandings of the paranormal pandemonium which surrounds that mystical fourth dimension and how it impacts our normal everyday lives. The Ghost Helper Show with Laura and Tina, teaching the living to help the dead, starts now. Welcome, everyone, to Ghost Helpers. I'm Tina Irwin, and I'm here with my co-host, Laura Van Tyne. And our topic today is what happened with Laura that caused her to end up finding that the paranormal was part of her world. And we want to start out by reminding everyone that we're discussing the simple fact that the paranormal is far more normal than anyone thinks. Paranormal stuff happens to people every day, and we're offering a different way to look at it so that you begin to see it as it surrounds you, and then hopefully we'll offer some insights and how best to use it. And we do want to have a shout out to uh, one of our listeners, Janina, who tagged us in an event that she went to at the Spokane Lantern Festival, and she reminded us, because we might have forgotten... (laughs) That karma never wastes energy. We never forget that, but it was just really cool. She, on her lantern that she sent out, she, you know, put karma never wastes energy. And if you're listening to us and not watching us, um, you can go to our Instagram at ghost underscore helpers and you can see that photo. So thank you so much, Janina. It's ghost underscore helpers. Just making sure. All right. Last week we talked about My terrifying story of the house on Botany Bay Boulevard in Charleston, South Carolina, and how difficult that was for me and my absolute desperation to deal with a ghost that actually got in bed with me and, you know, gave me one of those life experiences you're not ever going to forget, but you so (laughs) wish you could forget that. And I didn't know what to do with this guy. And nothing I tried worked. And I've spent a large part of my life figuring out how to cross over the dead. And finally we figured it out. And that's why one of our goals with this show is to help others, which is why we are always teaching the living how to help the dead. So this week, this week, we're going to turn this around and talk about Laura's experiences and why, you know, we say that we're seasoned psychics. Well, we always say we have this PhD from the school of hard knocks because You know, we didn't get to the goddess part or the priestess part. We're just really ordinary people. That got hit over the head by a cosmic two by four with these unusual things. And, you know, one of the things I want before we start into the story, I want to discuss is the term spirit, because we hear this a lot. And when I was looking for help, especially in the beginning, I had so many people say, follow spirit. Just have your six-year-old daughter trust spirit. Okay, people on what planet is that a good idea? I don't trust the ice cream truck driver at the park to, you know, why would I send my little girl off somewhere trusting spirit? So well, the problem, the problem is what is it? Right. What is spirit? And that was my whole thing in the beginning is what is spirit? Because we have and ghosts, we have angels, we have dark entities and a myriad of things. So that's why we don't use the word spirit. And Kat, um, there's a graphic there, if you don't mind popping that up. And if you want to see this graphic, it explains why we don't use the word spirit. And I'll also, after the show, post that on the ghost helpers, ghost underscore helpers. Is that the spiritual zoo one? It's the spiritual zoo. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's a spiritual zoo. It's a spiritual zoo. You go to the zoo and 
you say, hey, look at that mammal, right? Okay, well, I've got, you know, lions and cheetahs and tigers, and I've got some meerkats. Some of those things can hurt me and some of them can't, don't or won't. So that's why we don't use the word spirit. There are so, when we- You wouldn't willingly kiss a rattlesnake on the lips, you know? Right. <laughs> So knowing what it is that we're dealing with gives us our power back. If I were to say, Tina, just trust spirit. If you're talking to someone, how do you know who or what that thing is? When you blindly trust something you can't see, you don't really know what it is, and you're not sure who you're hearing, you basically handed off your personal power to this unseen, unknown force. And what, what we're going to talk about today is it's what happens as a parent when you wake up one morning and an astonishing thing has happened and you're not sure what to do about it. And let's talk about this new show called Psychic Kids. Okay. So years ago, there was a show called Psychic Kids and they just did a reboot of it. So now you've got these kids that are now adults or teenagers helping other little kids deal with other psychic kids. But honestly, Tina, I could only watch a few minutes because it was so terrifying to me. What I saw was this older kid leading a younger kid who is psychic and forcing them to talk to spirit. The kid didn't want to. Kid's terrified. How is that helping the kid? So, and also you're not crossing over that soul. So that soul now becomes a part of this family's life. And that is dangerous on so many levels. If it is a soul. If it is a soul. And that's another point. You don't know whether or not it's a soul. It's a lower realm intelligence. These little dark guys that we hear so many people see. As we continue, what? we're going to be sharing with you how to deal with them. But the first few shows are going to be about what these are, what they look like. But we have a progression here. So to me, that show was a little scary because it's not giving the kid their personal power. It's not saying, here's how you cross over that soul. If it is a soul, because a lot of times in that room, they're shapeshifters and I don't want to scare everybody away from us so soon in the game here, but it's a reality. That's why we don't use the word spirit. So anyways, I look back at my life about 10 years ago when my daughter was about six or so. And she could see and talk to all kinds of things that at the time I couldn't see. I was psychic as a kid and my abilities lay dormant. I wasn't allowed to discuss it or anything like that because it was when I grew up because it was like, no, people think you're weird. Don't talk about that. And my, these abilities went away with me. Well, karma, not wasting energy. Thank you, Janina. Um, handed me the psychic kid. And it forced me to relearn certain, certain abilities. And that's how we, ba- Tina and I basically met. So having said all of that, the word spirit is a little dangerous. Figure out what it is you're dealing with. And it's not easy to figure out either. And that's why when we're discussing a story, a situation, we're going to be specific is this a ghost? Is this something else? And if it is, what is it? And what do you do with it? And what do you do about it? Which is why we developed the psychic self-defense course just as a beginning. Yeah. You can begin to understand this. Yeah. And as Tina said, one day my husband and I woke up and all of a sudden the psychic switch got turned on with our kid. And if you have a psychic child and there's a lot of parents out there with psychic kids, You have an elevated responsibility to keep your child safe and to live a normal life in multiple dimensions. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's, (laughs) let's, that is a really packed statement. Let's unpack that a little bit. Yes. If you have a psychic child, I've had many parents come to me with psychic babies. Well, it's an ability, but it's an, a baby it's, it's an ability and the kid doesn't know that they're different. They don't know the difference, but the abil- the you have as a parent an elevated responsibility because as a parent, you want to keep your child safe from the neighbor who may be a pedophile or 
you know, getting lost in the street or, 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 right? These physical, tangible things that we can see, we can touch, we can feel. When you add a different dimension, one that most people can't see, but your child can, that's an elevated responsibility. And as a parent, it's your job to make sure your kid is as safe as possible. And it's not always unicorns and rainbows and white light in that other dimension. I think that there, there is a, I use the word misconception, that if you just put enough white light on it and you connect to spirit, and that's the term that I've heard, you know, for we all, on, yeah. we've all heard. It's very just common. Connect to spirit and put, give it white light and you'll be fine. And if that were the case, we would have no crime and no one would ever have a problem. The problem is that unless you understand the entire physics that go with this and there's karma attached, it's more complicated than that. And I would suggest that people connect to God or the divine. And directly. Directly. You, you don't need a mediator. You don't need a medium. It takes practice. It takes it's called the priesthood of all believers. And when you are connecting directly to the divine, I mean, there's several thousand words, seven thousand, several thousand different terms for the word God. They're called names of God. And they're all over the world. People have different names. So we're not going to get into semantics. But what we do want to offer is that connect directly to God and don't be afraid to say that connecting to spirit. That's like opening your front door and allowing oh, anybody to come straight in right to the source, right? Okay. You, you and, and people man. say source, but I would suggest that that as a beginning step, substitute the word spirit or source to the no, divine the source is God, the main go. I know, but people say I connect to source and that means a lot of different things to people. So my feeling is connect to God and just say the word. And for a lot of people who have been very hurt by religion, this is a very, very tough thing. And we're about to go to break. And when we come back, Laura is going to share an absolutely chilling story of how a murdered little boy came to live with Laura and her family. And you're listening to Ghost Helpers on Transformation Talk Radio. And we'd like to thank the Oil Lounge for being our sponsor. Sponsor. And we'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to Ghost Helpers. I'm Tina Irwin. And my co-host, Laura Van Tyne, is going to be sharing an amazing story that I think you're going to really want to listen to. And this story is about how a ghost can travel and what they go through. And just because somebody's dead doesn't mean that they've lost their personality. It's the only thing we take with us. We don't take our 401ks with us. We don't take our jewelry with us. We take the essence of who we are, who we have always been with us. That's absolutely true for whether you're an adult or a child. And one day my my daughter and i were at home we're alone and we're watching some feel-good show about like refurbishing a school like some poor schools getting refurbished and whatever and a commercial comes on and it's a dateline nbc promo about a little boy who vanishes from portland and this is about 10 years ago i think and how so, old was your daughter at the time she's about six or so maybe seven okay, okay. and you know, she looked at me, she goes, Oh my God, that's terrible, mom. And then all of a sudden my daughter's eyes get really big, like saucer. She goes, he's here. And I'm like, who's here? Cause it's me, my daughter, the cat, the dog, the rabbit. And she says, he's here. That little boy is here. And I can't see him at the time. So I'm asking her questions because I am really concerned about keeping her safe. I don't know what this means. This is really early on in the psychic journey. And she is telling me these things. He's saying, he's pointing the TV and he's shouting, that's me, that's me, that's me. And mom, he's just started crying. I said, what do you mean he started crying? He goes, he didn't know he died. 
And he, and he, the conversation I'm going to be telling you is through her eyes. And she says, he didn't know he died. And all of now he's crying and he's really sad. And he says, my body is not in the lake. It's not in the lake. And he's screaming that it's not in the lake because that's what this uh, promo was saying that they're going to look at a lake and this and that. And now he's like, mom, he wants to tell me what happened and he wants to show me. And I'm like, I don't know what that means, but I need you to tell me every single thing that happens because I'm dealing with my living daughter, but I also know that I'm dealing with a little boy who is lost and confused. I don't want to send him away. I don't want to banish him. I want to help him, but I don't know what help really means. And she says, he's showing me what happened to him. And she goes into great detail about he went to school that morning and there was a big science fair thing going on. And he was something like a science fair. He was like super excited and he wanted to look extra good and he was taking his time. And he, he was doing this thing. I think it was like on tree frogs and he's telling my daughter all of these things about tree frogs that I had no idea. Did you know tree frogs come in blue and they can be green and they can be red and some are, these are poisonous and blah. And she, my daughter is six. is six. She's never studied tree frogs from, I think, Central America. I don't know where they were from, honestly. And she is reiterating all of these things, these factoids about tree frogs. And you wrote all this down. I did write it all down because I'm thinking, what the heck am I going to do with this? Because Well, this is a good tip for any other parent. You were really smart to write it down. So I, going. I wrote everything down that was happening to us because I needed... I needed guidance, but I didn't know what kind of guidance. And this is before the internet is what it is today. So you couldn't really, it wasn't as searchable, which is a good thing, bad thing, because there's a lot of misinformation on the internet too. So I just wrote everything down and I wrote down his story and, you know, he went to school and then the person who took him to school or somebody came to him and they got into an argument because he was taking so long. And this person says, you know, I'm so sorry. I drop off your stuff at school and come back out and I'm going to go take you for ice cream. Now, you and I know that there's probably not an ice cream store open, but a seven or year old, I don't know exactly how old he was at the time. This let's call him seven. Doesn't really comprehend that you know maybe there's no ice cream store open and he told you who this person was he did tell me who this person was and he gets in the car with this person and he she gets angry with him and he's like and I was so confused I thought we we're gonna get ice cream and I thought she wasn't mad at me anymore and then she took my glasses off and I couldn't see where I was going and we just drove for a really really long time and he's like crying and crying and crying and my daughter my heart's breaking for both of these kids because at the same time, I cannot protect my six-year-old daughter from the horror that she is about to hear. So what is the greater good? To let this boy suffer in silence. If I was as psychic that time as I am now, I would have sidelined my daughter. I would have talked to him directly. Or if but, you'd have known me, we could have helped each other. Right. Yeah, exactly. But because I didn't, I had no assistance. I had to use my daughter for better or for worse. But I also thought I can counsel my daughter. I can help her understand these events. This little boy needs help. And I don't know what to do for him. And then this person gets him out of the car. And my daughter is just sobbing. She said, mom, he got shot in the stomach and he's bleeding. And and, and he says it hurts and, and I don't know what to do. And, and, and she's just going on and on and on. And I said, and I'm like, <laughs> cause I have no idea what to do either. I said, okay, all right. So tell me what he sees. And he says, he shows, you know, he tells her what she sees, what he sees. And, and I said, okay, to this little boy, I said, you're done with this moment. I need you to snap back to this living room. And it was like, you know, he woke up. And so now I have this little boy in my house who misses his mommy. And now for the first time in months, he's understanding why 
when he talks to his mommy, she can't hear him. Isn't that, isn't that just break your heart? Uh, I'm trying not to cry and tear up while I'm telling this story. Cause I, uh, and he said, he was telling me, he's like, I would hug her and I would yell at her. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. And my mommy's always crying and, and she doesn't know what to do. And, and I would run up and down the stairs really, really hard. And she just, she never heard me and I didn't know why. And I am just like, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. And, and, and when you're experiencing that, there's a part of you that has a, has a natural tendency to want to fall over the waterfall with this child. Yeah. And this is when you need to have detached compassion. Exactly. Because you can't help your daughter or this child. If I if, am a puddle. If you're a puddle, because then frankly, your frequency drops and you have to keep your frequency high. If you're going to help the dead. Well, and here comes the next part is how do I console this murdered little boy? I don't know how to cross him over. I don't know what to do with him. You did a really sharp thing. I mean, a really wise thing. You snapped him back to he's here right now. That bad part what was over because it was not his mommy who did this to him. No, it was not. It was not his mommy. It was somebody he knew, but it was not his mommy. And so you brought him back to, you centered him. I centered him. I gr like, you can't really ground a ghost, but I sort of grounded him. Right. So I snapped him back. And now this little boy starts living with us. And it made me realize when we talk about children who have imaginary friends, what is an imaginary friend really? I, I think that I, I remember, I remember being two years old and having an imaginary friend. Yeah. I remember it very, very clearly. And I could see her, but when we moved, she didn't come with us. And that was a really big deal because I missed her, but she was stuck in the house we were living in at the time. Yeah. And imaginary friends usually are ghost children, right. can also be a ghost animal. Sometimes you don't really have that many ghost animals, but it can, normal, be. It, it can, it be. can be, especially if it was a family pet. You can have yeah. a ghost child and that happens all the time. And, you know, um, Kat and Benny, I'm going to interrupt here. Do you mind if we skip this break? Um, so how do you console a ghost is the big question. And also what was happening is that sometimes this little boy would be in my house and sometimes he wouldn't be. And he would go back to his mom's house. Because a ghost can travel with the speed of thought. Yes. So he would go back and forth. And now my daughter has this not so imaginary friend. And I was concerned about my daughter because I want her to live a normal life as we all do. But now she has this new best friend who's a ghost. And she, I, I'm under a strict, I'm telling her, you do not discuss this with anyone for so many reasons. Um, we, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a public school teacher at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that would not be cool. I don't need child protective services knocking on my door. Thank you. And so now this little boy is living with us and he's commuting basically a thousand miles north of us to his home in Portland with his mom. And he's trying to communicate with his mom and it's not working and she's crying and she's upset. And of course she's upset. What mom wouldn't be? You don't know where your little boy is. Is it better? Well, they hadn't found to this day. They haven't found his no, body. And, and as a parent, that's, I think our biggest nightmare is, is it better to know that he has died or that he's still missing? I think it's better to have the finality of knowing whether he's alive or dead. I, I, I agree. I absolutely agree. I think for parents of a missing child is it is a unique form of, of, emotional torture. There's no other word for it. And in your situation, you were very wise to counsel your daughter not to discuss this for many reasons. Yeah. And so this little boy comes into our house and I could always tell when he was in our house because they would start playing. And apparently this little boy 
was just fun and funny and uh, my, my daughter thought he was a riot and they had so much fun together playing and my daughter would be in her room and I would hear her talking and laughing like you know a, a living mortal friend was in her room right mm -hmm. but it's only a one-sided conversation I'm hearing at the time you're not the only parent hears that either no and so with this we're talking about how this little kid what do i do with him and he's he's just adorable could you not love him i mean he is just adorable and you know according to my because i'm asking my daughter i'm like well you know the things he was saying was just adorable and it seems like he was just a high energy soul full of light and life and i'm struggling with this at the same time because you know if my daughter comes home with some friends and this little boy comes over he wants to play with all the children well did any other children see him no okay no and you know they would be in our pool playing and they would be you know doing all kinds of things together and it's all it's really fully not healthy for the child dealing with the dead all the time. Because with, with this little boy also came a lot of other souls. But this one was a He kind of opened the door. He kind of opened the door. And what was really heartbreaking one day was simply that he asked my daughter if he could go to school with her. Because he missed going to school. He never got to present his tree frog stories. And so I, you know, my daughter says, mom, can he, can he go to school with me today? And I'm thinking, it's not like I can stop him. <laughs> right. <laughs> but he was very obedient and, you know, he would listen to me like a living mortal child. It's like, you know, it's time for her to go to bed because ghosts don't need to sleep. Right. You can't wake the I, dead. You, there. Yeah, I said, you know, she needs to go to sleep now. She has school the next day. And he's like, okay, you know, this is again, a third party conversation. And he would, he would leave. And I think that in the nights he would go to his home is what would happen. And he would go back into his bed. And, you know, he would always come back probably about once a day. And it seemed like it was in the mornings crying and upset because his mommy missed him and he didn't know what to do for her. That's got to be it, it's a torture. It is. A, and he, the child is is tortured. The parent is tortured because no one really knows at the time knew how to cross over a child, an adult, whoever it was. And so you really you really needed to to know what to do and that's part of what really pushed you for your search for help my search for help because what do you do with this child and he was the first of many ghost children by the way and he asked if he could go to school because he missed school he loved school and he missed friends and, you know, he's about seven or so. He's about the same age as my daughter, which brings up a resonance issue. And she had things in common with this little boy, which, and they travel at the speed of thought. So as his commercial aired and we discussed him, that's when he pops in. Because she had, a, your daughter had a light around her yeah. that, for whatever the reason, and there may have been something about your daughter that <clears throat> was the same resonance, you know, happy-go-lucky kid, loved his mom. You don't know what the actual resonance issue is, but there can be one, which is why that ghost is attracted to that particular person, child, whatever. Yeah, and, and that makes a big difference. That's why a ghost will pick this person, but not that person. That's a very, that's a really good point. And it's a resonance issue. And now the other resonance issue that I was concerned about at the time is my daughter is being surrounded by death. Think yeah, about that. Would that would be really tough. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> she's surrounded by death. She's in resonance with death. It's not that I, and I'm not angry or upset at this little boy. I just don't know what to do with him. And he lived with us, I want to say for almost a year on and off. And he would ended up, you know, back to the whole, can, you know, he, mommy, he asked me if he can go to school with me. And I'm like, yeah, just try not to, you know, talk to him, talk to him, you know, just, you know, and, and I'm talking to him and I, he can hear me talk by the way. Um, is that you can't have conversations with her. She, no one knows what she can do and it needs to be that way. You can understand that. Right. And so I'm having this <laughs> very unusual conversation with this little boy. And I said, and you understand that you're dead, that you don't have a physical body, but her classmates don't know that. Exactly. Yeah. There's another element I want to point out here. I want to go back to the moment he told you that this woman shot him in the stomach mm -hmm. and the trauma for your daughter to, at six to see and experience that. And this is why and when my daughter, by the way, felt the pain of that bullet. Oh, wow. And I had to pull her out of that. And that was a scary thing too. I Yes. But again, you had, you were sharp enough and you had the wherewithal to quickly pull her out of it. You didn't wallow in the pain of that moment. And, and this is why Laura and I are very adamant when we hear someone say, oh, so-and-so is such a gifted psychic. If you Trust think me, it's no gift, <laughs> if you think what Laura's daughter experienced was a gift. I think we need to redefine the word. And I know a lot of psychics, especially in the, the new age movement, believe that that's a correct term, but we would like to offer a different view. It is an ability. She woke up one morning. She didn't get to go to a toy store to pick it out. This wasn't a gift anyone wants to see. And you certainly didn't give your daughter the gift of experiencing a child having been murdered and shot in the stomach. That is not a gift. It's an ability. And parents have to learn what do you do in such a situation? Because it's unlike anything you could be trained for. You're not crazy. Your child is not crazy. It's not a gift. It's a challenge on every conceivable level. And at yeah. this point, you didn't know how to help this little boy. I, I did not. And I'm going to go back to the whole parent thing. You know, when, when we're having kids and you read all these baby books, like what to expect when right? What to expect when you're expecting, what to expect the toddler years. There's not one book that says what happened, what to expect when your kid wakes up psychic one day. <laughs> and one of the other things that happens is it's sometimes no two psychics have exactly the same ability to the same degree. Exactly. And this is a really good point. So when we're dealing in this, the paranormal is more normal than we think. It's not a tangible physical thing. I can't, you know, pick up a pencil or something. It's more nebulous, which makes it hard to quantify. It is hard to quantify. But the science is the same. I, I also want to point out here that you didn't deny what your daughter saw. This is very important. You did not put her on drugs. You didn't punish her. And you didn't think she was crazy because your daughter had never lied to you. No, and you know, kids do lie, et cetera. My daughter is always very honest, in fact. Brutally so. <laughs> Brutally honest. <She's> <laughs> um, but as a parent, what rings true for you with what they're saying? And I could never have predicted that a commercial about a murder from a thousand miles away would bring this little boy into our lives. Yeah, well, that certainly happened to me, you know, I just, <laughs> and so with that, you know, he's going to school with my daughter now every day and he's thrilled. And basically what ended up happening over the course of the year. And by the way, they would bicker like friends would bicker too, every now and then they disagreed, they disagreed, which was kind of funny. And I, I had to laugh about that, but um, not that often and nothing explosive or anything. It's like, no, I want to do that. Or no, you said it was just kind of, kind of cute, but you know, no. not really. 
and he goes to school with my daughter every day and at night he goes to his mom's house and he's running up and down the stairs still he's trying everything he can do to get her to hear him to notice him to say i'm okay but he's not okay at the same time there's another sort of a different point here a lot of people may be thinking that why didn't you just call the mom or the news station and tell yeah. them everything you knew and talk to the mom and tell him what he's saying. And I, I would like to point out that that works beautifully on television if you're wearing sexy clothes and you have long brown hair, long brown hair. But if you're an ordinary person and you have a very sensation, this was an incredibly sensational story in Portland 10 years ago. When you have a situation like that, People view a psychic calling and saying, I have this information as crackpot, cruel, charlatan, and opportunist. And it is not viewed well. It's you viewed know as cruel. I did call the Portland Police Department. Okay. And the first thing, when I called the Portland Police Department, I'm like, what do I do with this? First of all, I can't say my daughter, we, we have him living with us. You know, I can't say that my daughter talks to him. I, I can't go that. I have to protect my. And so I called the Portland Police Department with the anticipation. I have some information that's from a psychic ability. This mail came on. It said that you are calling about this case and you are psychic, do not leave a message. There you go. I, I, I tried. Um, if I parent, I would be moving heaven and to find out. But this begs another point. How do you know what psychic to trust? Uh, exactly. And I'm sure that they were getting many calls and they turned them all off. And so in Ghost Stories from the Ghost Point of View, book three, there's a story about this. It's a very, very interesting story about what do you do if you're psychic and how do you leave a really valuable tip? And maybe that might help someone else. Maybe it might help a police department. I don't know. But in your case, every time I've talked to the, tried to talk to the police, it's like, oh my God, you're psychic. Leave me alone. You're a crackpot. You know, you wear aluminum foil on your head. Well, and it's hard to know what's the real deal. I understand the police point of view. I get it completely. And so that's why it's better to help the dead, yeah. which will in turn help the living. It's up to the police department to figure out how to solve the crime. You can't fix the crime. You can help the dead. That's one of the biggest takeaways. And that's why we came up with the crossing over prayer because it actually works. So let's talk about what did happen with him. So he's going to school with us every day. He's eating dinner with us, but not. Um, he becomes an integral part of our family. And, and you know, my husband and the other girl are like, yeah, he's back. Okay, whatever. They don't see or hear him, but with my youngest daughter, then yes, they do. So when we come back, I'm going to share the ending of this story and I'm going to just say, it, it's just a tough, it's just tough. I mean, what do you do with this? So when we come back, I'm going to share the ending of this. You are listening to ghost helpers on transformation talk radio, and we will be right back. Welcome back to the ghost helper show on transformation talk radio. Laura is going to tell us what actually happened to this child. So this little boy has been living with us and along with a few other ghosts, but that's a different story, different story for another day or many stories for many days. I don't know. And along the way, oh, this whole time, I'm also looking for help on the sidelines. It's not like, you know, my kids, this master piano player. Hey, do you know of a good piano teacher? Hey, do you know of a good psychic? My kid's really psychic. You don't do that, right? <laughs> Not easy. No. And so in a very long and roundabout way, I meet Tina and we start working together and she's helping me. And she actually helped me cross over a couple other characters that were living in our house. By the way, our house was so full that I think we would have been a fire code violation. We we're just like this ghost super highway. 
But this little boy was a constant scene in our home at that time. And then you and I went off. We had met, we'd known each other for about a year or so at this point. And we're going to go into that more. We'll go into that. And we ended up, um, you're all, you need more crystals. Let's go, let's go crystal shopping, remember? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm game. <laughs> I wasn't that airy fairy. <laughs> I was trying to raise your frequency. Yes. I mean, and I was teaching you how to use crystals to do that. I know, but let's go crystal shopping. Sounds so much more fun. Okay. And so we're in this hotel and I'm telling Tina about this little boy that keeps coming and going. And then he pops up in the hotel room and by now, by now I know how to cross them over and he pops up in the hotel room. And as we're crossing him over, he looks like this bright beam of light and he is so giddy with excitement. It's like, you know, it was Christmas time for this little boy. And, you know, we explained to him that, you know, with this angel, you're going to cross over in, into the that heaven gorgeous world. light that feels so good for you. And, you know, and he held the, this angel's hand. It was the first time he said that he felt warm. Cause the dead are always cold. The, it's cold in that fourth dimension. He felt warmth for the first time and he was bouncing up and down with these big eyes. And by this time I can see him and talk to him, by the way. And we cross him over and he says to me, as he's literally waving back, he's like, tell my mommy, I love her. And wow. What do you do with that? You send a prayer to his mommy and let her know that he's crossed over yeah. and that he loved her. Yeah. That's and that will help her grief tremendously knowing that she won't know, but there's a part of her that won't sense him anymore because you don't know if it's your grief or the, the grief of the person who died. Well, and let's talk about that a little bit because when somebody dies unexpectedly or even expectedly and they do not cross over and they start haunting you. Now, this little boy, as adorable and precocious as he, as he was, was haunting us. Not to be mean or, or malicious. He just didn't know what to do and he didn't know where to go. His terror in those moments that preceded his death shot his frequency down. He had no idea what was coming. No, he thought he was going to get ice cream. He and thought he was going to get a bad feeling something was coming, but he couldn't have imagined she'd shoot him in the stomach. And so his frequency is shot. And when you die and you don't know you're dying or going to die, you're suddenly ejected out of your body or something traumatic happens. Your frequency is so low, you may not see the light. And if you do see the light, you're stunned and you don't know to go to it. A child isn't going to know that this, and I want to have a, just a, a quick aside. Someone contacted us this week and said, you shouldn't cross them over because you're violating their free will. And that's probably a longer discussion, but I really want to address that child has no idea what to do at death. I think if you asked a hundred thousand people, what are you supposed to do when you die? Not a single one would know. And religions don't teach this. And if, you're hunting a ghost, you're not helping them. And it's, it's a really cruel thing. And when you learned how to do this yourself, you were completely empowered, which is our goal is to teach the living to help the dead. That's why we have the crossing over prayer. And, you know, you mentioned something that I want to kind of capitalize on. If this were your little boy, would you want a team of ghost hunters helping them? Or would you want to hunting find them? Hun, yes, hunting them. Or would you want to find somebody, including yourself, to get that information to help them, help them cross over, help them go home? It isn't a function of violating the ghost's free will. It is purely a function of spiritual service because no one knows what to do. And a ghost is not participating in soul evolution. They are languishing. It's like you put them in prison and they don't know how to get out. And 
it's one of the most profoundly beautiful things you can do. And it's talked about in the 23rd Psalm. I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Every Imagine religious- a child is fearing, feeling and fearing that. Every religious text has a version of that. It's not unique to the Bible. Every version has that. And when we're talking about a ghost and crossing them over, if you think about it, we all incarnate here for a reason, for our soul growth, our soul evolution. Once we leave our physical body, our karmic time here is done for now. Every holy text also talks about reincarnation and we'll get down to into that, you know, in, in shows down the road. But when we leave our physical body, our time here is done for now and we need to go home. And it's a ghost is incurring karma in that dimension dimension because they don't know what to do. And the karmic clock stops when they're crossed over and it enables them to be restored he restoreth my soul right direct quote we didn't make this up this really comes from all of the holy texts throughout the world we don't care what your faith is it doesn't matter to us if you're dead it doesn't matter to you either all you care about is how do i get the cold to stop how do i get the pain the loneliness the well, confusion to stop i'm going to stop you for a minute that pain part that this little boy was going through a lot of times he would relive those moments of death and he was in just as much pain. A lot of torture there. There's a lot of torture there. So when we cross them over, that stops. He's not getting the healing and soul restoration he needs languishing as a ghost. Nobody does as a ghost. And that soul is actually able to communicate with living family members far more red readily and wisely from the heaven world. It's really an astonishing concept, but it is absolutely the kindness you will want for yourself. Okay, so shall we? Yeah, so it's the kindness and compassion to cross them over, and we're going to be sharing with people how to do that as, as we move along here. So one little thing before we wrap this up, this precious little boy was murdered. This precious little boy needed help in crossing over. He didn't need to be banished by me. He did not need to be scolded by me. He did not need any of that. He needed love and compassion. He was still a little boy. And would you want your little boy hunted or helped? Okay. And with that, let's talk about next week. Yeah, let's talk about next week. So go ahead, Tina. I'll let you talk since I've been talking so much this time around. <laughs> September is Suicide Awareness Month. And I don't know of anyone who is unaware of it. I don't know why they say we're going to increase awareness. Yeah, that's it's like rude. breast cancer awareness. Yeah, we but all know. How many more ways do we need to know about this? The problem is that I don't know of anyone's life who hasn't been touched by suicide. And the focus of this particular show will be to understand the suicide secret. And we're going to go into that at much greater levels and explain some things that people may not have thought of. And that's what we're going to be doing next well, week because the dead have talked to us and we're going to share what they've said. And some of it is just chilling. We have had a lot of people who've committed suicide, their ghosts show up. And we talked to them and we've learned so much from them. And we're going to be sharing with you what we've learned from them. So hopefully it helps other people to think twice, mm -hmm. to move forward and to maybe have a different path, a different outcome. So you are listening to Ghost Helpers on Transformation Talk Radio, where the paranormal is more normal than you think. And we want to give a shout out to producers Kat and Benny for all of their amazing help and support. And with that, we will see you next week. Bye-bye.